as well. So it's the seventh session and uh, we'll have the pleasure to uh, uh, listen the lectures of Tamar Herzog and Jose Luis uh, Gio Garcia. Uh, and I, um, I welcome you uh, both to this conference. Uh, and Tamar, it's really nice to see you here. And I, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to see you here in Lisbon. Not, not here because I'm in Evra, but in Lisbon. Mm. Um, 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 I would say that Rogério asked me to make a brief introduction of uh, Tamar and uh, José Luis. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think Tamar needs no introduction, but as always, and this, despite such repeated phrase, I will say some words uh, uh, about uh, Tamar. Uh, she's a legal historian with a very successful academic career and a, a, a wonderful um, trajectory, academic trajectory. She started at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, then moved in uh, 97 of the, uh, to the University of Chicago and um, in uh, 25 to Stanford and um, in 2013, to Harvard, where she still uh, teach in the history uh, department and Harvard Law School. Um, she authored seven books, the, last, the latest three being Defining Nations, Immigrants and Citizens in Early Modern Spain and Spanish America in 24, uh, Frontiers of Possession, Spain and Portugal in Europe and the Americas, 2015, uh, and a short history of European law, uh, the last two and a half millennia uh, in 2018. So she's quite productive, as you see, and producing wonderful books and very inspiring books. All of them got numerous translations, um, either in French, Spanish, Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, and Portuguese, European Portuguese. And in some... Uh, um, more exotic languages, as uh, is the case of Korean and Chinese, for example. Um, she works on the early modern Iberian empires, including in the concept of empire, the, also the European dominions uh, of the Iberians, uh, as she did in Frontiers of Possession, where she observed the formation of the border between Spain and Portugal, both in the Iberian Peninsula and in the Americas, and uh, in order to understand how individuals and communities argue their right to land and at the same time defend who they were, defined who they were. Um, both uh, Tamar and José Luis are um, part of the European project Resistance and Rebellion in the Iberian Empires, 16 uh, and 19, which I uh, coordinate. Well, José Luis is a researcher of Max Planck uh, Institute, which is a partner of the consortium, and Tamar as an expert member of the, its uh, external scientific board. Uh, and um, on Tamar, uh, I, I, I invite you to uh, see and listen the interv interview uh, that we posted a few months ago uh, in um, YouTube channel, the, the research uh, uh, in the YouTube channel of the project uh, in an interview which was conducted by Benedetta Albani and Manuela Bragagnolo. Uh, and uh, well, um, I don't know if I should uh, introduce um, Jose Luis perhaps afterwards. Uh, and now, Tamar, the floor is yours. 30 minutes, I, 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 would, I was told 30 minutes. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mafalda. Um, it's a real pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. And actually this um, little talk is a tribute to a graduate student of mine who um, has worked on consent to labor in England, but because of her work, I became quite aware to matters of consent and ended up writing about it. So this is a, a manifestation of why it is good to have very good graduate students because they take us on adventures we never imagined. So anyway, so during the early modern periods, uh, as you all know, various European countries began engaging in overseas expansion. Early expeditions were followed by subsequent voyages, eventually leading to the expansion of European hegemony, 
uh, two parts of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. This intense encounter with non-Europeans produced multiplicity of complex outcomes uh, that I'm not going to go into here, of course, but among other things, it also unleashed debates regarding the legitimacy of European presence overseas. And although many polities and intellectuals would eventually engage with this question, the first countries to do so seriously were Spain and Portugal, whose monarchs, official intellectual subjects constantly asked whether native consent was required, whether natives agreed, and whether they had the right to resist. So historians have long engaged with some of these questions. Many surveyed the ways Europe uh, natives seemingly accepted the invading Europeans, either by allying with them or agreeing to cede them or sell them lands. Other described on the contrary, the context in which these dynamics unfolded in order to demonstrate that rather than affirming native choice, these instances manifested coercion and violence involved in these transactions. A third group asked whether native understood what they were agreeing to or supposedly agreeing to, whether they understood the results. Um, but regardless of the road that they took, uh, thus far historians have not yet examined how European imagined native consent and how they described native right to resist. So this is what I propose to do here. Uh, arguing that in colonial documentation, there are various ways uh, by which native could consent or disagree to European presence. Uh, consent could be explicit or implicit. It could be free or coerced. And each one of the situation gave rise to a different assessment of the right to resist. So let me start with explicit consent. The idea that natives could consent to European presence and willfully subject themselves to European was ubiquitous in colonial documentation. Telling of the way European imagined native conformity was for example, a ritual orchestrated in 1659 by the Portuguese Jesuit Antonio Vieira. Vieira who met in the American interior with a group of not yet subjected natives took an oath of obedience from their leaders who put their hands in his like vassals do in feudal homage and swore allegiance to the Portuguese monarch. The leaders were then embraced, those present sang the Te Deum, and the new subject threw their bows and arrows on the, on the ground. So very elaborate ceremony of agreeing. It was followed by the sounding of trumpet, horns, drums, continuous cries of infinite, infinite number of voices and sighting in multiple languages. Gift giving was also practiced as was dances and music. And to comm commemorate all that had happened, a huge cross was erected and venerated. The ritual took about three days to conclude, might have included the participating perhaps as many as 50 Indian principais and some 4,000 of their subjects. This was of course extremely spectacular, but not a unique ceremony because other colonial agents who interacted with natives similarly asked their leaders, native leaders, if they truthfully wished to ally with them of their own initiative. And they asked if it was free and spontaneous accord and then, of course, celebrated the response in public ceremonies that could be held in the local council chamber, in the presence, in the presence of aldermen, military officers, or any other individuals of distinction, as the period documentation calls them. So they insisted that natives agreed, and this agreement was free, was usually invoked in situation of first contact, but it did not disappear afterwards. For example, many Europeans pretended that natives could choose not only whether to ally with them, but also whether to change sides. The Spanish at least accused the Portuguese of actively engaging in efforts to transform Indians allied with Spain to allies of Portugal and said that to influence natives, this, the Portuguese offered native gifts and promised them a better treatment. Indians might have been told that Spaniards wished to kill them and that they maltreated the indigenous population. Bitterly protesting such policies, the Spaniards nevertheless used very similar tactics. We know that as early as 1620s, and most probably throughout most of the colonial period, Spanish Jesuits, for example, arguing for indigenous free choice, this is how they describe it, removed many natives from territories that were, alleged, that were allegedly Portuguese to Spanish controlled missions. By the 1750s, Jesuit belonging to the Spanish province might have been engaged in convincing Indians who were inclined favorably to Portugal, this is a citation, to ally with them 
and suggested that the Portuguese will make them slaves. The conclusion that natives agreed to subject themselves willfully, freely, led to violent response when they failed to act obediently. On such occasions, Europeans mainly concluded that natives could not be trusted. They were barbarians, this is what the documents say, who did not respect agreements and whose promise was worthless. According to this version, while Europeans were committed to peace, Indians were not, treacherous behavior was typical of them. Because despite their consent, they resisted, perhaps even rebelled, Europeans had to exercise extreme, extreme caution. They had to consider that arrangement with natives were unlikely to persist. Disappointment at native so-called inconsistency was frequently accompanied by demands for punishment. The resistance of those who agreed, it was openly argued, was both a breach of the accord, but also a criminal behavior that must be severely reprimanded. Of course, these kinds of portraits uh, raise a question, which is in, how do you interpret consent in a multicultural environment? Although these stories usually presented communication with natives as a simple affair, uh, Spanish and Portuguese sources nevertheless frequently revealed the great difficulty in interpreting native response. Uh, this said, Portuguese officials who often confessed that they guessed rather than knew what the Indians said, nevertheless assured their readers that despite the absence of a common language, they were able to correctly interpret native desire. Particularly in indicative of consent, the Portuguese affirmed were gestures that express happiness, for example, by natives proceeding to celebrate, and I quote, in their own gentle, gentile ways. Hugging and kissing and the acceptance of gifts were similarly interpreted as a communicating acquiescence. So strong was the belief in the ability to interpret behavior that meeting accidentally with what they called wild Indians of unknown nation with whom they could not at all converse the Portuguese nevertheless expressed certainty that the members of this group had manifested with a willingness and inclination to become subjects. Archival documentation thus suggests that European actors were predisposed to believe that natives would collaborate and quickly moved from speaking to them to celebrating their submission. This firm belief that natives would agree persisted despite all indications to the contrary. One extreme example was a 1771 report by a Portuguese military commander that affirmed that native agreed to subject themselves to the Portuguese, despite the fact that one, members of the group asked him why the Portuguese wanted to take away their land. Two, they refused to come and live next to the Portuguese and under their protection. And three, had probably attacked the Portuguese residents as they retreated from the Portuguese camp. In this case, and most probably in many others, native acquiescence was assumed rather than attested. It was read into native response and was imagined by Europeans who a priori sought to prove its existence. The lack of real doubts regarding the ability to contract with natives generally led to reject any behavior that seemed in contradiction with the agreement that the party was said to have reached. Rarely did Europeans ask themselves whether natives had understood correctly and whether they indeed promised what they Europeans imagined that they had. But why did European assume that natives agreed? So let me turn now to the power of silence and obligation to protest. Paradoxically, the assumption that natives agreed was often tied to the lack of resistance. This conclusion was based on a juridical doctrine that equated silence with consent. According to it, those who could voice disagreement and chose not to could be construed as having acquiescence. This understanding was reproduced, for example, in the 13th century Castilian compilation of Jus Comune, the Siete Partidas, where it was attested that, I quote, even if it is said that he who was silent does not always agree to what was said, nonetheless, this is true because he does not negate what he hears. Or as Grotius would eventually argue, I quote, if a person knows his property to be in the possession of another and allows it to remain so, without asserting his claim, unless there are sufficient reasons for this silent, he's construed as having entirely abandoned all pretensions to the same. 
This axiom that formed part of doctrinal, doctrinal discussion was nonetheless widely present and practiced by a huge array of contemporary actors. Most particularly, it was ubiquitous in discussion regarding the possession of land, people, or jurisdiction. In all these cases, to acquire rights, the interested party had to act as if these rights already belonged to them. That is, to possess the land, for example, they had to cut herbs, that is, perform activities that only a possessor could legitimately undertake. Or to acquire jurisdiction, they had to apprehend criminals. Yet of themselves, these actions were insufficient. What transformed these actors in possessors was not what they did, but the silence of those watching, according to the doctrine, right? It was this silence and not the acts themselves, which led to the conclusion that because no one opposed, these activities must be legitimate, and hence by implication, those performing them could in the aftermath be recognized as the rightful possessors. Many colonial actors were well aware of these rules, which they applied also to their interaction with natives. Already in a famous letter authored in 1493 and sent to the Catholic kings, Columbus, for example, testified that he took possession of the land he discovered, I quote, without any opposition being offered. In the following centuries, other European agents would do the same, constantly arguing that the lack of contradiction from natives implied that they agreed to their subjection and recognized Iberian claims to their territories. The rule that silent could be construed as consent reversed the burden of proof. Rather than placing it on the person pretending to acquire rights that normally would have to demonstrate either that those ceding the rights agreed to cede them or that the territory had no possessors, it placed the burden on those potentially wronged demanding that they manifest their this discord, because unless they did, they would be construed as agreeing. Because at stake was registering the reaction of those who stood to lose, if these potentially wronged wished to disagree, they had to do so clearly and unequivocally by external visible acts. That's what the doctrine says. Thus, if native did not resist, they agreed, according to the logic, hence, the facility by which Europeans concluded that natives consented whenever they were not aggressive, they agreed. Yet at the same time, because of these convic convictions on occasion, native resistance could be perceived not only as comprehensible, but also as indispensable. After all, resistance was a mean to manifest discord and the more violent the resistance, the better because it communicated a clearer message of rejection and thus would protect native rights. Okay, so let me now turn to another question, which is consent and coercion. But even if natives agreed, was their agreement binding given the coercive context in which it was given? To this question, Francisco Vittoria, a renowned Dominican friar teaching at the University of Salamanca, and I feel silly to speak about him in the presence of people who know much more about him than me, answered negatively. In a famous lecture he gave in 1539, he concluded that Spanish presence in the America could be justified by, I cite, a true and voluntary election of the barbarian, that's how he calls them, uh, who would spontaneously decide to accept the King of Spain as their prince. Though this could be a valid title, Vittoria nevertheless concluded that it could not be applied to the situation in the Americas. For the choice to be valid, Vittoria affirmed several conditions had to be made. First, it must not be made in fear or ignorance or under any other circumstances that he says vitiated the freedom of election. In the Americas, he stated, the request for subjection was made by armed men, armed men to defenseless crowds, therefore giving those who were said to be choosing no option to refuse. Second, those agreeing must know what they were doing and understand what they were being asked. This condition was not met in the Americas either, Victoria said. Third, in the case of the, in this case, sorry, the rule could not apply anyway because natives were already subjected to their own lords and could not acquiesce to a new dominion. Victoria thus concluded that because all these, I quote, requisite conditions for a legitimate choice were lacking in the Americas, so was consent. 
So Victoria's insistence on the freedom of choice was a reaction to ideological and legal debates, which questioned whether freedom was indeed required for a choice to be valid. If Victoria wanted those consenting to understand the meaning of the agreement and be free to refuse, other contemporaries did not. Particularly famous in this regard was a document elaborated in the 1510s that Spaniards were to read to natives before battle began. Best known presently as the Requerimiento, this text informed natives that the Pope granted control over the Americas to the Catholic kings, who thereafter were the legitimate lords of the territory. This document confirmed, I quote, almost all those to whom this has been notified have received and served their highness as subjects ought to do with good will and without resistance. So again, resistance. It established that they did so, I quote, of their own free will without any reward or conditions. The text then demanded those listening do the same as well as, I quote, consider what we have said to you and that you take the time that shall be necessary to understand and deliberate upon it. So the Requerimino clearly invoked the doctrine which Victoria also adopted, which required the choice to be both free and informed. However, it gave listeners no option to refuse, specifying that, and I quote, if you do so, you will do well, and that which you are obliged to do. But if you do not, I certify to you that with the help of God, we shall powerfully enter into your country and shall make war against you. And we shall take you and your wives and children and shall make slaves of them. And we shall take away your goods and shall do to you all the mischief and damage we can as to vassals who do not obey and refuse to receive their lords. The requirement, in other words, sought to transform Indian resistance to the Spanish invasion into an act of illegal obedience that of legal disobedience, sorry, that would justify the launching of a war and the imposition of severe punishments. In his History of the Indies, 1552, Bartolomé de las Casas commented on the absurdity of this document and asked whether it merited laughing or crying. In his Historia General y Natural de las Indias, Fernández de Oviedo did the same, mocking the pretense that Indians would understand its contents. Yet despite this criticism, the idea that consent could be present even when the only option was either to consent or to perish was much more widely accepted among contemporaries than the reading of Las Casas and Fernández de Oviedo would lead us to believe. Indeed, from as early as the 12th century, some Jewish suggested consent could be perfectly valid if coercion was conditional rather than absolute. Applying this distinction to thought Force conversions, for example, many suggested that an absolute coercion existed only when actors had absolutely no choice because they were held down while baptism water were poured onto them. While this type of coercion produced absolutely no results, conditional coercion on the contrary did. Conditional coercion existed in cases in which individuals acted under severe intimidation, for example, the admonition that they would be beaten, robbed, injured, even killed if they failed to obey. Though these menaces seriously limited the option available to actors, they did not entirely eliminate their will. After all, this individual willfully and freely chose to obey rather than perish. The conclusion jurists and theologians reached was that even if there was no free choice, following Roman law dictum, coacta enim voluntas, voluntas est, Forced will was nevertheless a will. In the following centuries, this interpretation became the most widely accepted opinion. Though some jurists and theologians continued to express the conviction that true free will was required for the action to be valid, most concluded otherwise. They argued that, for example, I quote, he who is dragged violently by torture and fear and accept the sacraments of baptism to avoid loss is considered to have conditionally willed. Even as late as the mid 16th century, the distinction between complete and conditional coercion stood firm, Jewish arguing that only absolute force, uh, coactio precisa, that rendered the convict absolutely passive, invalidated conversion. Thus, while discussions continue to debate how to distinguish absolute from conditional coercion, most agreed that coercion did not necessarily invalidate consent. 
This understanding present in juridical and theological debates was also widely practiced in the Americas, where natives were habitually told that they could either consent or suffer war and annihilation. Freedom, in short, did not entail the ability to elect between various plausible responses. Instead, it mainly embodied the possibility of choosing between exclusion and exclusion, inclusion and inclusion, exclusion, war and peace. This choice, it was argued, was valid, a native could be compelled to act upon it and be appropriately punished if they did not. If they chose, they must obey, rendering all resistance completely illegitimate. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to mention is the colonial paradox that allows consent to submit but incapacity to contract. European actors thus placed, placed at center stage native consent to their presence and native agreement to subject themselves. Whether demanding it explicitly or implicitly, whether allowing for coercion or insisting on free choice, European speakers enthusiastically engage in applying these categories to justify European presence overseas. By doing so, they implicitly recognize native capacity to take the decision to relinquish their autonomy, cede their territories and convert. In all these ways, relinquishing autonomy, ceding territories, conversion, natives were held to be legitimate decision makers and bound with a legal personality and legal capacity. Yet, while natives were theoretically capable of choosing to submit themselves to both, both king and church, what they could not do, according to colonialists, was to enter into binding agreements. This reality was succinctly described by Juan de Solorzano Pereira, who was a 17th century judge in Peru and the author of one of the most popular summaries of Spanish laws applied to the Americas, the Politica Indiana. Solorzano y Pereira explained that although natives were adults, without the aid of magistrate and tutors, they could not enter into binding agreements, most particularly to sell real estate or other things of price and estimation, he says. Solorzano explained that although natives were free, in their condition and subjection, uh, they could not exercise a true free will, but instead exposed, were exposed habitually to the site. Because according to Solorzano, natives were incapable of governing themselves and required the direction and assistance of others, their faculty to contract must be restricted. This paradox, natives being able to agree to European presence, but not to sell their land as individuals, was explained by colonial understanding that natives belong to a special category of people classified as miserables, who inspire compassion and required special protection. This status, originating in use comune and with consequences both canon and civil law, allowed concluding that like widows, orphan, pilgrim, the poor, Indians must enjoy what contemporaries argued was a privileged position which potentially shielded them from abuse. As far as we can tell, the classification of natives as miserable was first proposed by the clergy with the goal of facilitating native evangelization. Soon after, it was also adopted in the civic sphere. By virtue of this status, Indians, for example, could enjoy free legal representation or abbreviated legal proceedings. Protection, however, came with severe limitations. Among other things, in their condition as miserable, Natives could not represent themselves in the courts and their capacity to conduct many legal transactions such as selling land was severely restricted. Ironically, the handicap with regard to the celebration of contracts was an extension of a medieval rule that allowed those of protected status to retreat from unfavorable dealings and receive full restitution. In the case of natives, however, no case-to-case -case examination was required. Instead, the presumption was that all contracts, except those involving minimal commercial exchanges, were potentially prejudicial. As a result, rather than proceeding to cancel those contracts that were, it was preferable to prohibit natives from contracting altogether. The result was that while natives could consent to become vassals, allies, or Christians, and they could transfer their territories and jurisdiction in bulk, either by pronouncing their agreement or by not resisting, as private individuals, they nonetheless could not sell their land. This paradox persisted throughout the colonial period as Europeans constantly met and negotiated with new, not yet subjective native groups who were said to agree, but as they also contemporaneously limited the capacity of natives to engage in other legal interactions, of course, of much lesser circumstances. So let me conclude with very few words. 
about colonial consent, coercion, and resistance. The study of both explicit and implicit native consent, the difficulties in understanding what native desired, and the employment of coercion indicated that, though incredibly, incredibly important to Europeans, native consent mostly operated as a presumption. Natives were presumed to have assented to certain things, and this conclusion acted upon reality. Rather than being a manifestation of free will, native consent was a juridical and a political construction meant to confirm what Europeans already suspected, namely, that they were masters of the land. Yet discussion on native consent also revealed the presence of discord, as colonialists could not agree whether natives could truly consent, either because of the circumstances on the ground or because at the end of the day, many European discussions considered natives, if not outright lacking, at least having a diminished capacity to agree. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. We'll, uh, I, I guess we'll have the opportunity to discuss it a bit later. Now we're um, going to listen to um, Jose Luis Rio. Um, and I'm sure you all know him, uh, but uh, um, I will say some brief words. Um, his main interests are early modern political and juridic juridical thinking in Europe and um, Ibero-America. Um, he's currently a researcher at Max Planck Institute for Legal History and Legal Theory. And he did his um, PhD at the National Autonomous University of Mexico on discourses and interests about slavery and encomienda in early chronicles of Indies. He's part uh, of the project on the School of Salamanca since 2017. Um, I hope I, I got it everything right. And the aim of uh, and with the aim of creating digital text. Corpus, is it? Um, to his access to primary sources, their concept and contexts. Later, um, the dictionary will also be published in paper, um, I suppose. Uh, he's also involved in a related project titled Salamanca in America, uh, and some results are already available in the recent volume on the School of Salamanca, which is titled is the School of Salamanca a case of global knowledge production? Um, has re, his, um, was published recently to, this year. His presentation is titled Loyalists' Resistance, Natural Law, Divine Law, Fundamental Laws, and Royal Person in Europe and Spanish America in the 16th century. So we'll keep on um, in, uh, in the Americas and in the, uh, Euro uh, the Iberian um, empires. So please, José Luis, well, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mafalda, for your kind uh, well, introduction of my, of my CV. I wanted to thank you also, the, the organizers, because, well, for me, it's a kind of dream I remember myself uh, some years ago at the Faculty of Philosophy reading professors such as Angela de Benedictis, Diego Guaglioni, and Jus Resistendi. And now, well, I have the opportunity, thanks to you, of, of presenting some ideas about my research on Jus Resistendi, even if it, it is a topic that I, I didn't have the time, the opportunity to address too much in the, in the research I have been making in, within this project on the School of Salamanca. In fact, this is a topic that I address more, more my PhD in philosophy. So I have a PhD in philosophy. Uh, I wrote this PhD about a Calvinist jurist, uh, Innocent Gentigier, who was mentioned by Diego Guaglioni uh, in the introductory intervention. And this, that was one of the temptations I had at the moment of preparing this, this, uh, my intervention today. I have the Calvinist temptation. But well, in the end, taking into account that uh, Tamar Herso was also here and that my, the invitation of Rogerio, who had suggested me to address more the American topics, 
I decided myself to incur more in the um, uh, Catholic American exotic temptation and address the topic of Jews resisting uh, in this in this way. I'm going to mention only in a very slightly way what is the topic of interest to me in this uh, Calvinist jurist and the link with the scholasticism because uh, I don't know if this is also your your perspective when you read this literature sometimes very nationalistic, very about the, the Spanish scholasticism, but this is, uh, they, they study often the, the, the Spanish scholasticism as a kind of isolated phenomena, not linked uh, to, the, to the European purse. And I think this is quite a, a, fa a false perspective, no, not rendering uh, a good idea about the complexity of the, of the debate, yeah? That, this is one of my of my of my points. Yeah? So well, as I said, um, I have to confess. First of all, uh, I'm going to share also some of my sources, uh, especially because perhaps there are other interpretations of some of the of the paragraphs I'm going to to mention. Uh, let's see. And I'm going to try um, a kind of continuation of what Tamar stated, more thinking more about the, the, fir the first half of the 16th century. I will address more the second half of the, of the, of the 16th century, yeah. Let's see my PowerPoint. Right. Here it is. Can you see it? Yes. Right. As I said, I have to confess, first of all, that I face some difficulties to trace the guiding thread of my speech today. This is linked, first of all, to the fact that even if attractive for the historiography, Jews resistendi is a concept which has little place in early modern Hispanic sources, at least strictly speaking. So I'm close to the perspective, to the interpretation that was given today, for example, by, by Alexander Murray. Uh, more than about the so-called uh, use resistendi that was clearly stated or that could be clearly stated in natural law, divine law, or use gentium, uh, such as that, that, that would be the case for other premoder jura, such as the right faculty to dispose from one's own good, or the right faculty to defend oneself from being injured or killed, we encounter in this period, different discourses of resistance. So I prefer to speak about discourses of resistance than about Jews resistendi for the 16th century, yeah? For the Hispanic one, yeah? In fact, and this is perhaps surprisingly for a contemporary reader, what it singularized most of these discourses is the loyalist tone with regards to instituted authorities, and in particular, vis-a-vis the figure of the king and other supreme authorities. I will come back to this idea along my speech. Given that we are almost at the end of this interesting lecture series, I have to confess that I, I learned a lot, yeah? And after having heard so many interesting talks about episodes of resistance going from 13th century Castile to late medieval Aragon, Sicily, the Holy Roman Empire, the overseas context, my intention was to speak from a conceptual perspective as a historian of political philosophy and political concepts, and well, and to follow also this, this invitation of Rogerio Tost, uh, Tostes to speak about the, the American context and the, the American modalities of, of resistance and to evaluate in the, the, the resistance, yeah? Even also that the sources of my speech, they are mainly scholastic, uh, uh, scholastic treatises and resolutions or pareceres written within this wide cultural phenomenon of the so-called school of Salamanca. So Professor Mafalda Suarez uh, has referred already to, to this book on the global dimension of the school of Salamanca. I will take as red thread of my speech one significant classical debate regarding over taxation and forced labor in Salmantine scholasticism which illustrates this well what I see as a progressive Thomist erosion of the Aristotelian distinction between royal dominion and tyranny in the Salmantine writings. It is a kind of erudite and academic debate 
which initiated in 15th century Salamanca had nevertheless important American implications. So my, my idea today, what I wanted to do is to trace a link between the medieval Salamanca, taking respect that most of you of the participants in the Congress were medievalist, and uh, well, to show that that was still alive in, in the American debate in the, six, in the, in the 16th century. And well, these American implications, they have to see mainly with native taxation and the justifications given to maintain servicios personales in the Americas and with the way in which native rebellion was conceptualized and judged. At the very end of my speech, I will also talk about the very specific modalities of erudite, what I call erudite resistance, neither violent nor very spectacular, that can be perceived in the American scholastic literature corresponding to the specific fields of knowledge of moral theology and canon law. Well, from, from, a, from a diachronic conceptual point of view, there is also another important evolution in 16th century academic perspectives on resistance that has to be, or I wanted to mention at least, a displacement of the gravitational center of many discourses of resistance from the appeal to the divine law and to the authoritative biblical topoi or loci communes regarding resistance to the supposedly fewer conflicting realms of natural law and fundamental laws. That it was, I see that as, a, as an evolution in, in corresponding to 16th century, yeah? Um, I think that during the second half of the 16th century, the conscience of the entrenchment of or consolidation of the Christian church relying on not compatible interpretations of divine law implied a certain return to more secular justifications of revolt, both in the Catholic and in the Calvinist world. For the French context, as I said, I dedicated my PhD in philosophy some years ago to one of the Huguenot jurists who mostly contributed to this shift of paradigm uh, in Osangent. Here, for example, you, you have a mention to one of the writings of this Innocent Tiger referring to fundamental laws. And well, I think that um, we can observe a similar logic of uh, that happens in the, in the Calvinist sources. I have integrated other other sources corresponding to this preponderance of divine law in the first half of 15th century from the manifest of the, um, of the German peasants, of the Swabian peasants, to uh, Theodore the Best, also giving priority to divine law and to the violation of divine law as the main motive of, uh, of Jews uh, 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 resisting it. And that was also a parallel in, uh, there was a parallel also in Domingo de Soto, another scholastic, uh, other Salamanca scholastic, who also invoke divine law to, to justify the, the revolt or the, the rebellion against political authorities, yes. But I'm not going to enter into the detail, perhaps we can later talk more about that. And uh, what I see, or what for me it's, uh, it's interesting if we compare uh, we understand the, the Salamanca scholasticism in a, in a European perspective, is that we can observe a similar logic of relatively secularization, moderation, and historicization of the discourse of resistance among the Spanish jurists and theologians in the last decades of 16th century. Uh, for example, the jurist Fernando Vázquez de Menchaca, you have here an image of one of, the, of his books in the screen was, for example, a good representative of this kind of new approach to resistance and rebellion uh, as evils which, as the work of Roman history and the medieval vicissitudes of the different Christian monarchies had sound, they could result from the violation of the universal principles of good government and the violation of the customs of government of a certain kingdom, in particular to the ones concerning the participation of the state in the administrations of, of public affairs. I think that the Protestant and the Catholic world, they are not so far away in this sense, being both affected by the historical turn, which characterize in general terms, uh, juridical humanism. Uh, in both the spheres 
the logic of direct confrontation implied in previous discourses on resistance gave way little by little to a new conciliatory and loyalist tone in which the king was begged or even taught yeah, as if he was attending a kind of course of universal history about the devastating effects of tyrannical and arbitrary rule along history. Here, for example, you can see that from the 139 chapters of the Controversiarum Illustrium of Vázquez de Menchaca, well, most of them, they were a kind of historical accounts, uh, Rome and uh, Greece, uh, the Persians, so we know meaning to illustrate how most of the greatest monarchies and republics they have collapsed after putting uh, after putting into into practice tyrannical advices. Well, within my perspective, there is another uh, key issue implying in the 16th century uh, uh, Hispanic War a clear evolution of traditional discourses on tyranny and use resistance. I refer to what I perceive as a progressive erosion of the objective and universal criteria of tyranny provided by Aristotle in his politics. Two of the characteristics uh, mentioned by Aristotle seem for me to have been very important still in early modernity. Others were forgotten, were no more very mentioned, but there were two that in my opinion, according to my reading of the sources, were still very important. One of them was the monopoly of the government by flatterers serving the tyrant with an unworthy docility and being mostly foreigners or usurpers coming from the lowest social groups. A second very influent criterion defini uh, defining in these sources any uh, uh, tyrannical regime was uh, excessive ta uh, taxation, which for Aristotle and the Western tradition had been understood as an indirect way of seizing vassals' goods uh, and properties, yeah, with the deliberate aim of keeping them poor. It is not by chance, in this sense, that if you gave a look to the scholastic literature on tributary issues, they are usually studied as a sub matter of the most general debates about dominion and the different ways of losing and acquiring dominion over goods. During the late Middle Ages, when the political and ethical Aristotle was rescued from, from oblivion, Aristotle definitory criteria of a tyrannical regime were reproduced almost verbatim in Bartolus de Tirano, even if a part of the historiography has also considered Aquinas' writings, in particular his De Regno, to be a kind of faithful copy or reappraisal of the Aristotelian perspectives on tyranny and use resistance, there are important differences between them. I'm not going to discuss this in detail because the topic has already been mentioned, well studied, yeah. But in the Regno, Aquinas concluded that only if a pre existing higher institution having the potestas to judge and dethrone a ruler which had become a tyrant decided to intervene, could political resistance be justified? Quoting the biblical pa uh, passage uh, of the first book of, of, of Petrus, uh, be reverently subject to our masters, not only to the good and gentle, but also the forward. Aquinas had considered as a religious duty the obedience to every political authority. In Aquinas' perspective, nothing would be worse than the intervention of private, of, uh, uh, private persons and the multitude under the, the guise of a slaying. Uh, a tyrant, yeah? Therefore, for the common vassal, or in case any institutional solution could be contemplated, Aquinas proposed nothing more than, well, the seized from sin, resort to, to, to praying, having trust in God, who is the, the tyrant punisher par, par excellence, yeah? For the history of Hispanic political and juridical thought, the difference between Aristotle and Aquinas' perspectives on resistance had a significant impact. Yeah? Before the well-studied implantation of Thomas by Francisco de Vitoria in the 1520s, three generations of Salmantine masters, led by Alonso Fernández de Madrigal, El Tostado, 
in the middle 15th century and by Pedro Martinez de Osma and Fernando de Roa until the beginning of 16th century had been working on the translation and commentary of Aristotle, political and ethical writings, and remained, in fact, uh, quite faithful to, and, and dependent on, on Aristotle uh, uh, perspectives. Let me only illustrate one evident case of discrepancy between Aquinas and the Salmantine tradition preceding, by, uh, uh, preceding Vittoria, much more Aristotelian than Thomas, as I said, the consideration of situations of extreme necessity, this is a concept which, which uh, has been mentioned by, by Bill Primakinen uh, uh, this morning, and the appeal to common good to justify the adoption of salutary measures uh, bordering the kind of practice which Aristotle has considered to be uh, tyrannical. Yeah? Well, dealing with this specific problematic, both Aquinas and the Salmantine master, uh, El Tostado, together with many other late medieval authors, uh, have referred to the biblical passage that you have uh, in the screen, taken from, from the first book of, of Samuel, one of the most important theological support to justify the exceptional adoption of tyrannical measures, such as the forced levy of taxes and the recruitment of soldiers among the population. Yeah? For example, the French glossator, uh, uh, Nicolas de Lille, has considered the, the, the passage uh, as a clear godly concession to uh, Israeli and uh, later kings of an unrestricted dominion jurisdictionis and dominion possessorium over their vassals and their goods. Well, in the interpretations of Aquinas and El Tostado, we can uh, uh, observe a clear contrast. Despite considering in his Summa Theologiae that first Samuel had to be understood more as a kind of prophetic nightmare about how will future tyrants act than as potestates granted to kings, Aquinas considered that, well, in the end of the fragment, you, you have the, the most important part of, of Aquinas' reasoning. He had considered that it may happen, however, that even a good king without being a tyrant may take away the sons and make them tribunes and centurions and may take, and may take many things from the, his subject in order to secure the common good. Well, addressing the same in the same passage in the first book of Samuel, El Tostado, uh, he did not refer to Aquinas, but chose in, instead the very similar interpretation of Nicolas de Lira. Yeah? El Tostado reacted, as you can see here in the, in the screen, with a vehement condemnation of the appeals to necessity and to the common good of the kingdom, the usual false pretense of tyrants. For El, Tost for El Tostado, in fact, only tyrants could claim for themselves a dominion over the goods of their subjects, and no need could make licit to treat vassals as serfs. Besides, most of the, contour, of the conducts contemplated in First Samuel, says Tostado, they have to be considered as offense or injustice, this is the concept of uh, uh, injuria, and were not needed to secure the common good, for example, measures such as compelling the sons of Israel to plow his ground, reap his harvest, and make weapons for his war. This kind of measures served only the private interests of the king and inflicted a great harm to the subject. Yeah? So in consequence, say uh, Tostado, they could not be requested from by a king. Well, I have presented this late medieval debate between Aquinas, Lira, El Tostado, and others, uh, about the limits of royal authority concerning ta taxation, land ownership, and personal service requested from vassals because it was far from being dead letter in the second half of 16th century. Well, if we say now to the Americas, those were precisely the key points of the discussions about the way in which Native American peoples should be ruled after their juridical integration into the ground of Castile, the 16th century uh, history of the Spanish America could be narrated, in fact, as an endless succession of failed attempts to consolidate a land use and a fiscal system 
which could make the newly acquired domains profitable for, for the Castilian crown without decimating the already shortened native populations. Well, I have there with uh, this topic in previous publication, for example, here you have one focusing on the increasing attention of Spanish juries working in the American audience vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, pre-Hispanic fiscal customs, yeah? Well, when Alonso de la Vera Cruz and an Agustinian friar, who after having studied theology with uh, Francisco de Vitoria in the 1520s, he sailed to America, uh, spent 20 years in the newly conquered pro province of Michoacán and became on his own one of the first master of theology at the University of Mexico, founded in the mid uh, fifth, uh, uh, 1550s, he decided to intervene in some concrete land ownership and tributary issues with the first relectio written in America. The title of this relectio was the Dominion Fidelium at Justo Bello, and he approached the, the topic coming back precisely to the different interpretations of first Samoan. Yeah? In his own reasoning that you have here, Veracruz, well, he followed a zigzagging way. This is not only Veracruz way of addressing the question, but it's the, the scholastic way, yeah? On the one hand, he seems to make a plea for the interpretation given by El Tostado. He referred to as a, a, a Sabulensi, so the, the Bishop of Avila, against the authoritarian interpretation of Nicolas of, of Lira, clearly denouncing the error of those who state that from this biblical text, the royal power extends to all expressly enumerated there. Nevertheless, Little after Aquinas' interpretation is taken is taken as the as the middle equi uh, 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 equitable position between the extremes represented by Lira and Tostado, and while copying almost verbatim Aquinas' prima secundae in his Mexican relectio, Veracruz states, "Well, the king or emperor has dominion over what he possesses and over what he owns personally. He has dominion and ownership over the tribute." that comes to him justly, but he has no ownership over what is owned by private individuals except for jurisdiction. And in case of extreme necessity, he can dispose of their property and is morally bound to do so for the common good. Well, such a cultural translation of Aquinas' positions to the Western Indies implied that in case of necessity, the emperor could dispose of native goods and native persons themselves as if they were their own possessions. Given that the Spanish colonies were in fact needed to secure the temporal and spiritual goods of the Commonwealth, native lands, especially if communal, superfluous, and not cultivated by the local populations could be distributed to the Spaniards wanting to build estancias, caballerías de tierra or molinos, Common good means, in this case, and above all, the conservation of the new world in Spanish hands. On, on its own, the extreme necessity to be attended was that of the indigent uh, Spanish colonies who, as it was clear, lacking of goods and lands, they will surely leave America and it's, uh, leaving also the, the inhabitants in the alone in the, in the lodge. Yeah? While well, the Tommy's influence had therefore a certain impact in the way in which land ownership and fiscal issues were discussed and regulated in 16th century Spanish America. Of course, this is a very superficial, purely scholastic, and learned approach to a complex debate in which many other sources were well, royal and this royal uh, legislation, the law suites settled by the, the American audiencias and the Council of the Indies, etc. they should be considered. Yeah? If we approach now the topic of native resistance from the tributary perspective about which I have been talking, it is important to underline that overwhelming fiscal pressure and forced labor were behind almost every attempt of native resistance in early modern period. While as Tamar Herzog state, the Spanish American context has important peculiarities. Even if among the historians of the so-called Derecho Indiano, since Ricardo Levene at least, there is a recurrent discussion about if the Western Indies were or not colonies in the contemporary sense of the term. I think that the special criteria that at this time were used to judge nat native resistance or to imagine it as, as Tamara stated, yeah, 
they are only explainable as a part of a logic of political domination, which is colonial. Yeah? First of all, the obligations toward the king and the political authorities of the overseas vassals, they were determined according to criteria which were much stricter than the ones of the Hispanic kingdoms that began with the process of assessment of the tributes uh, to be paid by the native in inhabitants. Well, for example, in this same relative, the Dominion Fidelium, uh, Veracruz denounced that despite the fact of being much poorer than the Spanish farmer, the Purepecha of Michoacán, they were asked to pay four times more tributes than, or, or, or even more, yeah? This is the, the sentence that you, that you have here, yeah? Against such a colonial bias, we can retrace two different attitudes among the Spanish American scholastics, yeah? A first group, including Veracruz, advocated for the homogenization of the fiscal requirements made to Spanish and to American vassals, yeah? Because the Indian, they were also vassals. Apart from different examples of, of taxes, assessment taken from the Iberian context, classical passages of the Roman legal corpora stipulating the tributes to be paid to the emperors were also proposed as fair criteria. Here you have, for example, a mention to the paragraph, the suscriptoribus prepositis of the Codes uh, uh, Theodosianus, yeah, integrated in Justinian Digestum, who had stipulated the duty to pay the 50th part of the production of wet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, while um, Veracruz, uh, he said, well, there is a great contrast between what this, this source stipulated because Native Americans, they, they, are, they are asked to be paid more than a 10th uh, part of the, of, the, of the grain, yeah, of their production of grain. Well, when Veracruz wrote his, his Relectio in the New Spain of the 1550s, the topic of the indigenous rebellion, that is to say the armed resistance or escape of the natives who in the language of the Spanish soldiers had already agreed to submit to the jurisdiction of the kings of Castile and were converting to the Christian faith, that was not a, a very boring issue, in my opinion, yeah? only for the, the sources that, I, that uh, I had read. In fact, when in the last part of his Relectio, Veracruz revisited the question of the unjust and just titles granting the Spaniards the right to wage war against the natives, he didn't evaluate as an, if one of the hypothetical just titles the right to wage war against nat native vassals incurring into rebellion. Neither Vitoria had reflected about the indigenous rebellion as a kind of justus titulus in this famous Relectio de Indies. In general terms, we can say that in these early scholastic approaches to the dominion of the American infidels and just war, writing in parallel to the process of conquest, rebellion was not a trending topic because the strategic goal to be achieved at this period was the justification of the first entrance of the Spaniard in the indigenous lands. For example, one of the pragmatic goals of Veracruz Relectio that you can see here in the, in the image, in this, in this quotation, was the legitimation of the deployment of an army to, to, to subject the native populations of Florida and assure a later Pacific reception of the, of the missionaries. Yeah? We have to wait uh, some decades until the end of the 1570s once the Spaniards had explored and began to colonize a wide part of the Americas, growing from the desert of uh, Northern Mexico to the Southern Cone, to see the emergence of indigenous rebellion as the central topic of some brief scholastic treatise. If you have uh, one interesting source, the Tratado de la Importancia y Utilidad que hay en dar por esclavos a los indios revelados de Chile, written at the end of 16th century, by the treasurer of the Cathedral of Santiago in Chile and published in Madrid in 1607 as a part of the documents who the procuradores of the Kingdom of Chile presented to the Council of the Indies to assure the success of their claims and complaints against the rebel native Mapuche populations. In 1598, the Mapuche, they, they, they managed to destroy all the small cities established by the Spaniards shoulder to the Bio Bio River, the conflict was strategically presented as a rebellion 
even if, uh, given the dispersion of the Mapuche and their lack of a central authority, it was not clear how many indigenous populations had previously accepted the supremacy of the Spanish uh, uh, authorities. To this argument, also the, the ideas that were presented by, by Tamar about the understanding, how the, the understanding these requerimientos uh, has to be mentioned, yeah? Well, why this another similar conflict open uh, at this period with the Guarani, with other indigenous populations were strategically presented as rebellions or using the word rebellion. Well, for the contemporary Spanish monarchy and in particular in the American context, there is one important element which absent for, from the central or northern European debates on rebellion, singularized the debate about the way in which rebellion should or could be punished. I am referring to the solid link between rebellion and enslavement, yeah? a penalty to which the Spanish monarchy resorted during the reigns of Philip II and Philip, um, and Philip III, especially after the rebellion of the Morisco vassals in the Alpujarras in the early 1570s. Well, that new trend supposed a rupture with Charles V, Charles V prohibition of indigenous en en enslavement that was contemplated in the Leyes Nuevas and reiterated in later cédulas. It broke also the non-writing tradition according to which the proper way of dealing with rebellions was to punish the heads of the revolt, but showing, well, magnanimity, the greatest virtue of the kings, yeah? Uh, they were sent to show magnanimity with the common people, well, but it is clear that the infidel, non-Christian condition of Moriscos, Mapuche, Guarani, Chichimeca, etc., contributed much to a logic in which the enslavement of whole populations was considered to be the equitable punishment to rebellion and to the delicts committed by the rebels. Uh, here, for example, you have this mentioned in Calderon text, according to a logic who expanded one of the titles of enslavement to be found in Roman law to crimes, yeah, the slavery as, as a result of delictum, to crimes happening in the political sphere. And finally, well, to the crime of apostasy. Calderon took all these elements into account, considering that by virtue of the titles, which had been argued to justify the enslavement of the Morisco and other American indigenous populations, the rebellious Mapuche could or could also be enslaved. It is important to consider that this treatise was, was written by a member of, secular, of, of, the, of the secular clergy who before sailing to Chile in 1555, he had studied at the Faculty of Theology of, of Salamanca, where, where else, yeah? Where Calderon obtained the bachelor degree in 1552, so in a period in which the main master of the faculty was Melchor Cano, a uh, direct principal of, of Vitoria, I think that Calderon treatise is a good example of how decisive the erudit and abstract Tommy's reflection on, on resistance to many historians, well, this year is totally disconnected from the world and reality. Well, they address very concrete problematics worldwide and had a true impact in, in reality, yeah? We know, in fact, that under the pressure of Calderón and the Spanish colonies of Chile, uh, Philip III approved the enslavement of the Mapuche with a cédula dictated in uh, 68. It is also a good example of how a certain scholastic reflecting thousands of miles away from Salamanca could still, could still write in line with his masters and keep echoing the Thomist perspective on common good to justify the adoption of the kind of salutary measures which the Aristotelian tradition had considered to be tyrannical. I don't have to, the time to enter into many details, but what Calderon wrote in his Tratado could be seen as a step further in the above mentioned Thomas erosion of the Aristotelian discourse on tyranny. Previous appeals to extreme necessity and common good lead out to what I see as a culmination of a long-term eroding process and a discourse on rule almost purely grounded on utility. It is in fact not by chance that Calderón gives his writing the title Tratado de la Importancia y Utilidad. Yeah, you can hear the, the title. 
in Calderon perspective, Utilida was invoked to justify, first of all, the war and enslavement of the rebel Mapuche populations of Southern Chile. It is interesting in this sense that before entering into the typical scholastic evaluation of juridical and theological arguments pro and contra the war and the enslavement, Calderon decided to present some ideas which, despite the uh, lacking of legal and theological ground, deserve to be taken into account and while well, analyzing the issue from what we today we would call um, an economic and pragmatic perspective, Calderon presented uh, at the very beginning of his tratado some argumentos de importancia or utilidad, underlining that a drastic increase on the number of indigenous slaves serving the few Spanish colonies in Chile, too poor to pay for the slaves imported from Africa, would make Chile an attractive destination for other settlers. According to Calderón, at the turn of the century, they clearly preferred the richer mining regions of Mexico and Peru and ran away from Chile at the, at the, when, whenever they could and had to be, in fact, forced by royal authority to remain in such a dangerous and little rewarding region. Common good and utilidad were, secondly, the razón uh, that, that Calderón mentioned to justify the excessive tribute and servicios personales required from the local encomenderos to the native populations who were already under the effective co control of the Spaniards that he, well, a little euphemistically, he distinguished these Indios as Indios que ahora son libres y de paz. Calderón was conscious about the fact that these natives had been overstretched by harsh fiscal demands, asking from them a quantity of labor bordering what a human being could, be, could perform, and that in virtue of necessity, they had been treated as, as serfs kept as prisoners in the houses and ranchos of the Spaniards where they were forced to perform servicios personales. Calderón also recognized that native vassals, they have been impeded to, to marry and forced to work at the mines during periods of, of eight months. So the, 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 they were not the conditions of vassals, but of, of slaves, yeah? As I said, Calderón was conscious that all these requirements were aberrant uh, and even contrary to natural law, not, not comparable to the kind of services asked in other latitudes, reaching a limit in which the difference between the juridical condition of natives, vassals of the king of Castile, uh, the jury and the facto slave became blur and almost imperceptible. Well, nevertheless, Calderon acute understanding of the native motives of grievance didn't deviate him from a extremely realistic attitude towards the proper means to foster the common good in Chile, he did not only exclude the implementation in the short term of measures aiming at alleviating the heavy burden carried by Indios de Paz, but considered also that only by enslaving the Mapuche and other native rebels could the working and living conditions of these Indios de Paz uh, be improved. Well, uh, in my perspective, uh, it is clear that in the, in the American context, coloniality deformed all the, the charitable, and so to say, uh, uh, Republican justifications that previous Thomists could have given in order to defend the adoption of salutary measures intended to foster the, the common good. The common good of the Republic became, in this kind of, of writings, an euphemism meaning the de facto the, the survival of the Spanish colonial project, a per se goal to be achieved by all means, including, of course, those clearly trespassing the limits between listed royal dominion and tyranny. It is, of course, a matter open to discussion, but I think that in many occasions, in the colonial context, there is still a distinction between principatum regale and tyrannia. Uh, which, uh, as I told, had been progressively eroded uh, and perverted in the 13th century, became completely meaningless and was no more a normative uh, relevant bias. How am I doing with the, with the time? I, I already finished my, my available time. Yes, yes, yeah. you did. You, <laughs> you surpassed the time. Very good. Well, only to mention that in the scholastic literature, there were already 
well, erudite forms of resistance. We, we were discussing about that in the seminary that we hold at, uh, at Frankfurt. Yes. And well, for example, this Alonso de la Vera Cruz uh, is also a good example of how in the concrete fields of moral theology and canon law, uh, that there could be a, erudite juridical forms of resistance that are not against the supreme powers, but take profit of this of this uh, of this superior powers, the pope, the king, in order to resist the local and regional authorities, such as bishops, local councils, uh, etc. If we if you want, we can talk more about that later on. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Luis. Very interesting talk. Um, um, perhaps now uh, we're a bit late, um, but I don't know what to, what would Rogério Tostes um, thinks. But I would give a, a kind of ten minutes. Is it possible? Ten minutes at least. Um, yes, I think it's uh, Bob. Professor Angela is here, uh, firm, since the first minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, because Professor Angela is going to speak at six o'clock, yes. right? Um, yes. Um, so uh, perhaps we'll give um, time for one or two, one round of questions. Yeah. Yes, I think that what do you 10 think? minutes is fine. 10 minutes. Professor? Okay, so um, okay. I'm... Okay. Uh, I don't know, Thank perhaps you. the easiest way, Professor Quaglioni, do you want no, to, to ask something? Unfortunately, it's too, too late to, to, to discuss this interesting contribution. Uh, but uh, um, I, I, would, I would say that um, um, Jose Luis Eguio uh, is right in, in Putin. Uh, the issue of taxation at the center uh, of, uh, of the speech, mm. because uh, because taxation is uh, strictly and strongly linked with the problem of uh, the mutual relationship between the sovereign and subject, um, because of the way uh, taxation is. Is obtained uh, by uh, efficacious, but by uh, uh, donation. And donation is a contract. Donation is a contract. So, in, in the literature, in the legal and uh, political literature of the late 16th century, uh, you, you, you can find uh, some uh, important examples. Uh, of discussions about um, uh, uh, taxation by contract um, in Baudin, for instance. Baudin says that there is more violence in, the, in a fictitious donation than in, uh, in, in, in the taxation imposed by, by the sovereign. But this is only one of the arguments uh, um, and and the, all medieval sources you you quoted in the first part of your speech, uh, coming from uh, um, exegetical literature, from theological literature, and also from uh, legal literature, constitute the common framework, and 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 the, in in some sense also. Uh, yeah, the common background uh, of, of the 16th century literature, of the late 16th century literature. So um, uh, there is a tradition, and, uh, and I think you underlined this so well, the importance of, of this tradition for the literature of the late 16th century. So um, there is a strong continuity between medieval and uh, and uh, and uh, and 16th century literature. So thank you for your speech. Thank you. Um, can you 
perhaps it's better to collect one or, or, or two more questions and then give the, the opportunity to, to the lecturers to, to, to answer. No? José Luis, do you want to answer or to comment or some kind of remark? Yeah, yeah well, only a, a little comment to the interesting question of, of Professor Quaglioni. Well, I, I think that this uh, issue of, of, of uh, taxation, for example, in the French literature, not only Baudin, but uh, also in Assange and Tigé, many other, they just start um, uh, uh, commenting on use resistance precisely dealing with the, the medieval writings, the, the chronicles of, uh, of uh, Philippe de Comines, that is the, the K reference, one of the, of the K reference, how Philippe de Comines was, uh, was narrating also the fightings between the kings of France and the, and the assembly of the three states. Well, this French literature is quite clear, and it is also becoming important, according to my reading of the sources, uh, at the end of the 16th century, because of the historical approach of, uh, of this new generation of, uh, of juries uh, impregnated by, with, uh, with juridical humanism. So it is not by chance that, uh, that uh, Baudin, Gentige, and many others, they take as most important sources these this medieval chronicles. For me, it was also a very, very important point that I have been discovering in the, in the last year reading some scholastic critics writing in the American context. They are not, they are not so many and they are difficult to find, and, uh, but they have not been so very well studied. So just a kind of feel of opportunity, at least in my, in my perspective. But well, the debate, uh, as, I, as I told in my intervention, uh, one, yeah, the history of 16th century America could be narrated as a, as a history about how the Indian vassals, the native vassals, uh, should or could be taxed. There are different criteria. One is, uh, ah, yeah, they, uh, they could be, they have to pay the, all the tribute that they can pay. Uh, another perspective is the, cost, the customary one, but which, which uh, customs? The custom of Castile or the indigenous customs? Uh, they were not clear yet. So it's because of this, this, uh, this uh, problem that comes once and again in the debates that the issue of, of tributation is so important. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Um, thank you, uh, Jose Luis. I have a question for Tamar, for Professor Tamar, and um, from uh, Carolina Gual. And uh, she asks, the ritual of subjection you described seems to resemble the feudal homage rituals. Was there some kind of reflection in the sources about attempting to reproduce models of subjection that were already in disuse in the European context? So it's kind of connection between medieval and early modernist. In the American, yeah, in American well, you context. know, the the question of whether um, there is a continuity between medieval and early modern, of course, is a huge, huge question, legal, political, social, in so many ways. And you know, I tend to always say, of course, there's a continuity, and of course, there's change, because by definition, they're both always all the time. Uh, the sources themselves, the um, where I got this narrative of this is is a is a chronicle of a Jesuit writing about Vieira. And there is absolutely no um, open reflection, but obviously, as I mentioned in my talk too, it does sound at least some elements, not all of it as a feudal homage, but then there's so much discussion in the literature right now if homage was ever the way that it was described stereotypically. Um, but there is a certain, there are certainly elements in which uh, first that, that are very important that subjection to the church and subjection to civic authorities are seen as two facets of the same type of relationship. In this case, uh, the mediation of the clergy in order to get subjection, um, the use of elements from rituals that they would have known from other scenarios. Um, so I think one of the most interesting thing when we do these studies is precisely to see how 
people take the uh, existing um, tools, ceremonies, ideas, language, and uh, fit it to new circumstances, better or worse, with more difficulty or more ease. But that's what uh, I think societies do in general, and I think Jewish certainly do all the time, even today. Um, so certainly we have constant rehashing of things, but also innovation as a result. But yes, it does, it does sound, but the funny thing, of course, he's not the master. The master is the king of Spain. He's just a Jesuit who's supposed to convert them. And the <laughs> ceremony is actually more, sounds as a ceremony of civic conversion, but they also adore the, the cross. Um, but it's not a ceremony of religious conversion, it's just civic conversion. So it's really, really an interesting ceremony. Thank you, Tamar. Uh... Um, I have another question, um, and perhaps the last one. In the last lecture, uh, it's from Cassiano Malaco Malacar Malacarne. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last lecture, the limitation of the emperor's power over his subjects reminded me of an excerpt from Pernington's work, The Prince and the Law, uh, 1993, reporting the record of an anonymous medieval chronicle. Um, this indicates how Roman law was still widely used, whether in the Middle Ages or in colonial times in America. Emperor Federico Barbarossa uh, was riding a horse with jurists and teachers, Bulgaria and, Mar and Martin. He then asked if, according to the law, he was the emperor of the world. Bulgaria replied that he was not. According to ancient Roman laws, the lord of private properties, houses, subjects, objects, etc. Martin, however, said that he was the lord of the whole world. Frederico got off his, got off his horse and gave the horse as a gift to Martin, but gave Bulgaria nothing. Bulgaria regretted Frederico's choice with these words, I lost a equine because I upheld ec equity, which is not equitable. Amisi ecum quada di, well, qua dixi ecum quad non fuit ecum. I don't know, uh, if Martinus and Bulgaris, um, well, um, I don't know if you want to comment something or um, um, on this uh, on this um, remark that Cassiano Malacano did. Tamar, Jose Luis. Well, we, it's uh, an interesting example of uh, how the the king, the emperor, they was not granted the right of or the uh, of dominion over the goods of the vassals, but the. Um, Hundreds, uh, thousands of examples that uh, that can be compared to to this one. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, um, I'm I'm sorry, but we're it's six o'clock, and uh, if you want to have a, a kind of five minutes break uh, before listening to Professor Angela de Benedictis, uh, we must stop now. Um, I thank you all, especially Tamar, Erzog, and Jose Luis. Ejio um, for their excellent talks and uh, sorry for not having more time to discuss it. Um, is it all right, uh, Roger, we stop now? No, it's perfect. I just uh, want to uh, say thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy uh, for both interventions and especially because they are Perfect in the way that they 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 complement each other. No, on one aspect, more this uh, diffusion of uh, um, exegetical tradition, and another way how it was uh, managing in the uh, pragmatical administration. You can say so of the conversion and the. Uh, this is one thing I want to comment is not a question. It's just a, I I want to comment. Because I see that it's more or less uh, connected to uh, Rio and also especially Professor Tamar. Uh, I don't know if uh, you are familiarized with the reality of colonial reality in Brazil, but um, the people from the region of 
to the São Paulo, you know, to the state state of São Paulo, they are uh, well known in Portugal for their um, behavior as a uh, rebels, as a uh, very rude and rebel people. And it's very interesting, uh, especially because first they are in a very um, far way, you no know, far for position of the colony, and they had some level of autonomy that they create and replicate their own way of living. But at the same time, that they were considered very rebel people from Portugal, they consider themselves very loyal people to the crown. They created the their narrative when they were very strong and attached to, to, to King's values, you know? It's very interesting because in some point, uh, it shows how this uh, understanding uh, of connection to the a center of power so far, you know, from the reality is some, how to say, um, sort of projection. Uh, I, I don't know if it's... And while you're talking about that, I kind of had some insights because this is a... a I think that I'm not a specialist on the subject, of course. And here we have two professors from uh, Universidade de São Paulo. <laughs> Uh, who can talk better about the, the, this uh, topic, but it's very interesting because it reveals some peculiarity in a way to uh, shape their own uh, narratives about uh, submission and you know, uh, resistance, of course. Thank you. So um, we'll close this session. Uh, 